Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, since I'm not a filmmaker and we have some very eminent filmmakers here, uh, I cannot show you my film or I cannot show you my book that you have you read it uh, in one day. So unfortunately for me, uh, it's, this is a book that you probably haven't read. Uh, some of you may have, but most of you wouldn't. So I'll just quickly introduce it in the fundamental assumption that you haven't read it. Uh, it's called uh, John Gutter Tarkovsky, uh, Citizens, Filmmakers, Hackers. Um, John Ghatak Tarkovsky is a student slogan of the Film and Television Institute of India. Um, this is a, so, uh, as I guess you all know, uh, in 2015, there was a strike, uh, a major strike by the students of the FTI, which started in June and went on till, I think, October of 2015. Uh, that strike ended in failure. And I've been very interested in failure as a concept because failure doesn't allow for closure, you know. Failure, the, the story doesn't end, you know, it's a kahani of baki hai kind of thing, you know. Failure has a long tail and failure has lots and lots of consequences which go on to this day. And we will talk a little bit about some of those consequences uh, uh, in a bit. Um, so the strike happened between, two, uh, between June and, and October 2015. Uh, as we were discussing in class, and many of you are in class, uh, and we have actually a student who was part of uh, a major protest that took place in 2014 in Calcutta um, in uh, Jadavpur University. It was called Hawk Kolarob, and this was the first time that you had a, a student protest that actually shook the, certainly the city of Calcutta. Um, uh, th that particular protest had come up, uh, as many of you might remember, when there was, a, there was an incident, let's call it, and we won't go too much into the incident, which was a local incident inside the university campus, which becomes a major nationwide controversy when the police entered that particular campus and uh, led to uh, probably one of the first social media driven campaigns, uh, it was called, Hawk, the hashtag was called Hawk Kolarob, leading to I think one lakh people taking to the streets of Calcutta and forcing the Vice Chancellor to step down. Uh, in June 15, there was of course the FTI strike, but there were many other strikes in university campuses before and after 2015, but January 2016 were the events, the far more famous events of JNU um, associated with Kanaya. Once again, an incident when the police entered the, the campus. Uh, coincident, coinciding with the events of JNU were the events in Hyderabad Central University with, associated with the name of Rohit Vemula, um, which I guess you all, all know. And you had, had a series of such events led to, leading to what came to be known as a winter of discontent, which culminated in the events of Jamia Millia in, the, in December 2019, once again when police entered the campus and Aligarh Muslim University when, when this happened. Now, all these universities that were there were behemoths, they're major universities, 30,000 plus students, huge campuses. And in that whole history was a film campus with a, with a capacity of, I don't know if you can believe it, 200 students. So FTII had a, had a student camp, had a campus of 200 students who took on a strike which was a very specific strike involving the governing council of that place and, you know, the, uh, the, uh, fact that this particular chairman of the governing council was keen, seen to be someone who was not qualified for that post and whose only qualifications for that post was that he was uh, a kind of a, a functionary of the BJP. You know, that was the only reason for why he would have someone like that. So how did a strike of that kind become such a central strike, how did it become such a famous strike was a question that I think I and many people are asking. And I think that the larger question that I was very interested in, how does cinema, the cause of cinema, not the cause of cinema in the service of some other cause, cinema itself as a cause, you know, ki cinema ke liye ladenge. I mean, now cinema ke liye ladna is what, does, what is, what is the cinema that you will have to fight for, that is one thing. And the second thing was the kind of strange and complicated thing was that why did this cause carry such a lot of, such a lot of, um, salience or such a lot of meaning for so many people in so many parts of India that students campuses across the country actually stood out in solidarity with the students of FTI. So uh, I got very interested in this question of the cinema and, 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 the, and a 
definition of political cinema. And I got particularly challenged when you had, uh, you know, instead of saying Halla Bol and Awaz Do Ham Ek Hai, you said Eisenstein, Pudovkin, we shall fight, we shall win. Now, imagine a situation where Eisenstein and Pudovkin come along with uh, whatever, Phule, Ambedkar, <laughs> and uh, whatever, all the other names that are associated with slogans, and, and, and take to the streets of India. Imagine a situation where you not only have a cause of cinema, but you have Eisenstein and Pudovkin joining that, that cause of cinema in, 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 in something like uh, India. This led to this other slogan. So there was basically, as you, you can imagine, uh, this uh, origin, origin of the slogan, are, ho, ho, ho Chi Minh, we shall fight, we shall win. You know, Ho Chi Minh is a Vietnamese slogan. But that had led to many others. Yeah, I think there was what? Uh, I think Nehru, Pule, Ambedkar, Gandhi or something, we shall fight, we shall win. And that was then modified by the students of the FTI, John Ghatak Tarkovsky, we shall fight, we shall win. So, this was, I think, what got me sort of very interested in the question of a political cinema. You know, what is political? I mean, political cinema is not a new concept in India. I mean, you know, we have had filmmakers who have made political films from the time of Dada Saheb Phalke. He made his films for Swadeshi. You had films subsequently in the in the cause of in the independence struggle. You had radical films, you know, socialist films from 1946 onwards. I'm thinking of Dharti Ke Lal by K. A. Abbas and so on. And of course, uh, the whole series of films from the 70s onwards, not least by the names that is Ghatak and John. K. John and Ghatak among, and Tarkovsky were filmmakers, were political filmmakers. But what happens when such political filmmakers encounter this kind of politics? What would John and Ghatak have said to the strike? of the students in, uh, in 2015 was what I think got me interested. Huh? Um, after I got interested, there were two or three other things that I got interested in. One thing is that uh, in India, and this is something that again we've discussed in class, um, cinema is been a political question from the beginning of cinema in a very interesting and peculiar way. We are all aware, again, something we've discussed in class, you're all aware of the fact that at this point of time in India, the rule of preventive detention is dominant. Yeah? Preventive detention ka matlab kya hota hai? Preventive detention ka matlab aise hota hai ki that you will arrest a person, you will stop an event from taking place, you will uh, give no permission to a, a rally for fear of what might happen, not because of something that has happened. Okay? If let us say a rally has happened and violence has happened or something illegal has happened, then you crack down on the people, that's one thing. Maybe you don't support it, that's, that's quite one thing. But to stop something from taking place or to arrest a person and put him or her in jail because of what they might do huh, in the future is to do two things. One is to create a fantasy world that will happen like this. Agar isko, you know, other jail me under need to wo aise kuch karega or karegi or something, you know. And you're, you're creating a kind of a fantasy horror world of what might happen if this or the other happens. And the more the horror is created, the more the public, uh, something, yeah, 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 this, this rally has to be stopped, this person has to be stopped. Okay. Now, there has been a legal argument that prior restraint which is the larger concept of preventive detention, prior restraint, matlab, you're stopping something in, in the beginning itself. Um, according to the legal scholar Upendra Bakshi, we had had in India the entire history of the criminal procedure, the Code of Criminal Procedure, CRPC, which is what's dominated the legal system. But he says there's a parallel legal system in India now, which is around the Article 22, 22 of the Constitution of India, which is to do with preventive detention. And this particular structure of which the UAPA is the most prominent example, is a new legal apparatus and India is currently being governed by that legal structure, okay? Around private, pre preventive detention, so internet shutdowns, for example. All of these kinds of things are associated with that. Now comes a very strange claim that I want to make, which is that the concept of prior restraint is come from the cinema. <laughs> you know? um, Justice Mukul Mudgal famously said, because what happened was that they were trying to look at the amendment to the Cinematograph Act of 1952. And when they were looking at the amendment of the Cinematograph Act, there was a committee to do this. And Justice Mukul Mudgal said that the cinema in India has been so persuasive you know, that it has led to all kinds of things, including lovers 
jumping to their doom because you know that is what Hiranjha did or whatever you know that is what heroes and heroines do that actually people did this that and I quote Justice Mudgal cinema is the only art form in India to be governed by an act of parliament you know you have a cinematograph act you don't have a painting act <laughs> you know you don't have a poetry act but the cinematograph actually has an act in which the argument around the reasonable restriction on free speech, which is Article 19 by 2, is translated into the cinema. And the Cinematograph Act of 1952 is the cinematic variation of the Constitution of India applicable to cinema. Okay? Now, the other point that I wanted to make was, this is the point that Rupendra Bakshi made, was that when censorship has happened in cinema, Roughly speaking, and there's been a lot of censorship in cinema from the 1940s to all the way to, to till now. The initial acts were primarily to uh, initial um, legal procedures primarily to do with obscenity. And basically, in 1969, we again talked about it. The GD Khosla Committee on Film Censorship happened. It basically assumed that sex and violence was the only thing that censorship was de dealing with. Yeah, obscenity dominated censorship. Okay, so the only kind of censorship was what dom was, was was existed in that category. K. A. Abbas, Khwaja Ahmed Abbas, was a member of the censor board, was a member of the G. D. Khosla committee, and he said that they had no concept of political censorship at that time. So he made a film called A Tale of Four Cities to challenge the censor board. Yeah. And that's a little history, which is that what happened was that he made this film to challenge the censor board, and this led to a situation where they first banned the film, as they would, or not banned, they, they denied him a censor certificate. Then they gave him a certificate with cuts, he, he rejected that. Then they gave him a certificate without cuts, he rejected that. And then he modified his petition in the Supreme Court basically to say, I challenge the very existence of the censor board. This led to all kinds, you know, like the, the FCAT, the, the, the appellate tribunal was basically put in place and so on. But essentially the point was that in this whole time, obscenity, defamation were what dominated censorship, right? This has changed. Today, films are no longer censored on obscenity. They are entirely censored on public order, okay? So public order and security and integrity of India threat to foreign countries and that kind of thing, that is the section which is what dominates censorship. So today, if Khwaja Ahmed Abbas was, was censored, it will not be because of obscenity, it will be because public order and this will lead to section 124, I think, and it will lead to him being arrested. Huh? It will be lead, it'll instantly lead to him being, to, to do that. So that all, all your history is finished. Censorship has now moved into a very, very different area. This different area is something that actually goes back to late colonialism, when that was how it was done then. Yeah? So, so this, this history of cinema has become a particularly interesting history because cinema as a threat to public order and the stopping of films being shown for fear that they might cause a danger to public order is, I have claimed, the template on which the very concept of prior restraint has been defined in India, okay? which makes cinema a very significant question to address in India. It, it, that's that's what that's what I came to came to realize. Um, I have been very interested, generally speaking, in India. For me, uh, at least my generation, I think the history of modern India begins not with 1947. The history of modern India begins with the emergency. <coughs> essentially, Essen the emergency is when you know everything of. This, you know, b before the emergency is almost like colonial, late colonialism, it's like a different time, it's a different Ramana. You know, what the, what the tha, you know, Nehruvian era, all the nostalgia that is there for the Nehruvian, uh, everything that was good about that time. Of course, you go back in time, but essentially the emergency is a very important development, which I think is central. And a lot of the political uh, questions around cinema emerge at that time, and this is what I think uh, is for me the cutoff point for which I will talk about in this large question. So what now happened was that in 2015 when this strike happened, the questions that it raised and this idea of Eisenstein, Pudovkin and John Sutter Tarkovsky actually took me back to the 70s. And so this particular book sort of more or less begins <coughs> with the 70s. You know, and then there is a, a, a series of sort of subsequent uh, arguments around how filmmakers have dealt with uh, the kind of political questions. Like for example, film collectives. 
uh, that I mean, there's a history of film collectives that has that has existed from the 70s onwards. Actually, it goes back in time from, to the 40s. It's one of the f earliest collectives went went back till then. But some in the 70s, you have a whole series of film collectives and so on. And then I come to uh, the point when something changes, you know. And and I'm very interested in what something changed in Pune. In Pune, there was a specific moment. You can actually target it to a specific moment when something changed in Pune, and that was the murder of Dabulkar. Yeah. So when he is uh, when he is killed uh, on the streets, the, uh, basically the, this is when the FTI is organizing uh, a, face, uh, a screening of uh, I think Jaibhim Comrade, and they invite the Kabir Kala Manch to perform in uh, the NFAI, and they get attacked by the ABVP. Uh, that attack happens in 2013. And that is when I think the FTI itself, I think, becomes goes somewhere else. You know, it, it actually shifts somewhere else because it finds itself in a Pune, um, which has become quite a different Pune. So, in a way, I think this book, which is talking about 2015 and is talking about the history of cinema, is also politically bracketing the the, the period roughly between 2013, which is when Dabolkar's murder happens, and 2007. Uh, end 17, early 18, when the Bhima Koregao incidents happened. So those are the two brackets that I'm specifically interested in. You know? And I'm interested then in the shift that takes place in the cinema in this time, yeah? along with a lot of political incidents that, that, that now start, uh, start taking place. So uh, for example, Anand Teltumde, uh, I'm sure the name is familiar to many of you. Anand Teltumde was one of the, he's a, he's a very important political scientist and journalist. And, 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 a, and a kind of Ambedkarite, shall we say. He was in jail uh, until quite recently, and he has a number of books on the <coughs> subject. What he describes is a kind of condition of mediatized impunity, huh? which, which he says is new. Obviously, he says attacks on Dalits, <laughs> violence of that kind is not new. What is new is the way that this violence not only is performed in the public domain, not only does this violence exist in a, in, a, in, a, in a hyper visible space as against something that takes place in invisible conditions, but this violence is often done in front of the camera. You know? So there is a certain kind of a mediatized violence that is now taking place where no effort is being made to prevent, uh, to, to, to hide the fact of who the guilty party is. You know exactly who's done what because it is done in front of the camera and for the benefit of the camera. Okay, it is in a situation where I mean, like for example, if you look at the events of Delhi 2020. The you can you can in five minutes, you know, if you can just sit together and look at the footage in five minutes, we'll know who's done what because it's there. All the data is there. There's no confusion about who's done what. So now comes a peculiar kind of a legal hiatus, a legal gap between the evidence as is produced by the moving image on the one hand and the inability of the law to accommodate that evidence. So you cannot even to this day legally prove who said Goli Maro Saloko. We do not know who said Goli Maro Saloko as far as the law is concerned. Of course we know who said it, but we can't prove it. Okay? This gap is a gap that has multiple consequences. It has consequences in, in aesthetic forms. It has consequences legally. But it has enormous and direct consequences for filmmakers. You know, because you are, as a filmmaker, in a situation where you're, if you put up a camera, I mean, essentially the point is this. I mean, what we have again discussed in class, this thing about indexicality, you know, that if I put up an image and I shoot this, then the assumption is that what I have shot is this. If I put up this thing and I, this, this is a lawn, you know, this is a tree, this is a whatever, you know, that particular association between the image and the reality that it is captured is a is a is an intrinsic association. You know, I show an image and that image means this. My ability to interpret that image means this. Now that increasingly that relationship between the object shot and the representation of the object is broken. Okay, now this is a big deal. It's a really, really big deal that's happened. Okay, it's, it's, it's. I mean, this is one of. I mean, there's many consequences to it. It leads to a situation like, like what's conventionally called fake news or or manipulation and all that stuff. But we will be discussing how 
um, as an aesthetic thing, when you have images that are digitally produced, you know, then the digital status of those images has very little relationship with the reality that that image has supposedly sought to capture, which was there in the, in the time of celluloid. This means that as a filmmaker, when you are working in this zone, you are faced up to very different challenges. You know? And this is, I think, led to a very different set of, set of consequences, led to a very different sort of filmmaking you know, that, that, that is taking, taken on this particular burden. It's, a, it's, it's no longer the kind of, let's say, documentary cinema, the kind of documentary cinema that we have been familiar with from the 1970s through to the, 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 the 90s. You know, the kind of filming associated famously with Anand Patwardhan or with the Yugandar Collective or with, uh, you know, all kinds of filmmakers who really were, we have an honorable history of documentary cinema that had existed. Today, there's a gap between that kind of cinema and what is today called, you might call, call it the post-truth documentary or the post-reality documentary or something, you know, which is actually leading to a very new set of challenges for filmmakers and for even, even those who, who, who see films or, or show films or how, how these are done. The first time I encountered this particular problem was actually not in India, it was in Hong Kong. Um, when, uh, here's what had happened. What had happened was that uh, in 2019, there was an, um, you know, uh, okay, here, so essentially the quick uh, little history to this was, and this is of relevance I think even to India, that when the protests happened in 2019, uh, they realized that you cannot have a protest in a defined time and place. So, Occupy was no longer possible. Like Shaheen Bagh, for example, was something Hong Kong would have said, you are sitting ducks. You know, you, they will come and get you. You know, you cannot do that. You know, you cannot be defined in a time and a place. You have to be invisible. You have to be highly mobile. And you have to move in a way that you have to be leaderless. You will not have to have any visible sign of something that, get, that could arrest you or that could capture you. You have to be elusive to a certain kind of authority. Huh? So they were actually looking at situations where they would have strikes or hits or moves in different ways. In, in, I mean, they used the term, this is a phrase that uh, they took from Bruce Lee, uh, the Hong Kong martial arts, I think it's called Be Water. So you had to be water as, 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 a, as a protester. You know, you could not be in any... Sorry. Uh, given space or, uh, or, or time, right? Uh, this, was, this is a new kind of protest which has been in, in Argentina in 2001. They called it horizontalism, horizontalidad. You know, it was, a, 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 I mean, along with this was the idea of protesting not as full-time political activity, but protesting almost like gig economies. <laughs> uh, so you had, for example, in Hong Kong, a situation where you had... Uh, for example, like the middle class going to work in offices would come down at the lunch break and have a, a small sit-in and come go back to work. You know, that kind of thing, you know, weekend protests. Protests, in the, protests by people who are not professional agitators, as it were. Right? Uh, who, you know, and, and this led, I think, to a very different sort of um, structure of in, informality and, and, and elusiveness so to say, right? And I wanted to suggest that many of these new uh, student protests that are there actually do work with that and they, they kind of use social media in different ways. And this I think is also, a, you know, shifting the domain of documentary away from that earlier kind of documentary in which, you know, this is the argument that we'd had about propaganda, you know, and I was saying that the whole problem with propaganda is that propaganda assumes that I have a position, point one, and I am trying to convert you, the viewer, to my position, you know? So I'm trying to persuade you to my point of view. That very few of these films actually try and persuade anybody to, any, to anything, you know? There's very rarely a sense of trying to, trying to uh, propagate a point of view to someone, you know, it, you know, enlighten the unenlightened kind of thing. This is actually no longer talking, or talking that sort of thing. Instead, it's doing something else. What is the something else? And I'll just say that and we can conclude. Um, something else is this, in brief. Um, I mean, it's again something we've discussed in class, that if in a way the history of Indian cinema has been associated with public order, and if the censorship of Indian cinema has been something that, that is defined prior restraint, then the parallel thing is that the movie theater, you know, has been an incredibly important instrument, uh, institution of, the, of, of a democratic public 
sphere. You know, when uh, your capacity to purchase a movie ticket and watch a film was an incredibly important democratic right that we had, and that came out in the in the late silent cinema, and you know, this has been talked about by, by many people. Now, such a democratic right to enter the movie theater and see the film has to be translated into the narrative structure of what you are seeing. You know? So the film, as it were, inherits the spectatorial right and translates it into a narrative structure of editing and shot making and, 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 and things like that. Right? So a protagonist, a protagonist is your representative inside the story of your democratic right as a spectator. So the, the, the protagonist will do various things that represents you. And it's a very unstable relationship inside the narrative structure of storytelling because the protagonist starts doing things that you don't like, you will take back your right as a spectator. You know? And the spectator's withdrawal of spectatorial rights is a very interesting part of narrative structures. And I've also argued in this particular book that the filmmaker in India, whose right to free speech is something that we have historically always validated, is a conditional right because it is, in a way, the right of the filmmaker to free speech is dependent on the ability of the filmmaker to contain the film and make sure that that film is not going to lead to, you know, extra textual meanings or interpretations that are in, in, in incendiary. Because if the behind the filmmaker is a censor board, because the censor board says to the filmmaker that filmmaker, if you don't take care of the film, we will take care of it for you. And behind the censor board is the police, and behind the police are the courts. You know, and, and all of them kick in the moment the film starts looking like it's an unstable entity if its meaning starts becoming something other than what it is, as it were, supposed to mean. So the big shift now is this, that this protagonist, the guy who's supposed to represent the spectatorial democratic rights of the audience, seems to have gone missing. Okay? More and more, I'm finding in these kinds of recent films that I'm saying, which are these post-protest, or sorry, post-leadership kind of this new protest cinema, actually have what I'm describing as an absent protagonist, uh, an empty shape, an empty space where the protagonist was, uh, you know, it, where the protagonist has now become the person behind the camera. <laughs> you know, the filmmaker. Is tr so what essentially happens is that in many, many of these films, it is the filmmaker who is navigating the spectators through a way of dealing with this reality. That is the story. It's not a given reality. It is not a reality that the reality exists between the film and the spectator. That's all that there is in that reality. There's no other reality that, that exists. You know? And I think that some of the films that uh, we're seeing, I think Shahrukh's uh, and, and Bafa's film that we saw yesterday, and Arbab film, which we're seeing tomorrow, and there are a series of other films that I've been very interested in. Payal Kapadia's film, which we saw some parts of this morning, where again, there's an absence, there is no protagonist. You know? And you have a situation of, a, of a, uh, an uncertainty where the protagonist was, where actually it leads to these almost like fantasies you know, that, that, that kind of arise. So this then becomes a certain kind of a new politics, a new political cinema, a new idiom of uh, p politics. I think documentary is a particularly important example of it, but I think this is also true in, 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 in fiction films. When you get a certain kind of a, uh, an absence, you know, where uh, the hero was, uh, there is no hero anymore. You know, there is a certain, the, the entire process is the one of how you will, as you saw in yesterday's film, you know, how will you navigate through this particular kind of space as you look at the film and what, what are the aids that you get. This is a new kind of, to use my colleague Madhav Prasad's phrase, cine politics. You know, he used the word cine politics to talk about a history of political cinema which actually takes to the streets and he was thinking about Tamil Nadu. Uh, and the, all these movie stars that, that became politicians or Karnataka where you have, you know, huge political figures, I mean huge movie stars turning into very, very big political figures or, or Andhra Pradesh. But I'm actually thinking of cine politics in this sense, in this particular sense of a new breed of cinema that seems to be emerging in the light of, shall I say, this post Teltumde situation of mediatized violence. Yeah? It's trying to react to that. Kind of kind of situation, yeah. And I think that the FTI strike became then a instance of not only an experimental structure with these particular cinema, but how this could be actually could actually become a political cause. And this then, and this is my last point. This then is 
the sort of cinema, it's not, it's not any old cinema, this is the sort of cinema that the FTI students made into the kind of cause that became such an important issue in India. Something like that. You know, this is, this is what I think this book is essentially arguing. So, um, I mean, yeah, so it covers a large time span. There are three chapters in the book that are specifically about the events of uh, June and, and, and October. And then there is one chapter about the aftermath. And then there's a concluding afterward, which is about some of these new laws that have taken place. And some of these laws are associated with film. Like, for example, the revised uh, cinematograph bill that has taken place, the new uh, regulations on OTT platforms that's, that's taken place. And subsequent to even the writing of this book, uh, the new uh, privacy, um, the, the data protection bill that has taken place, and now the new, um, the new broadcast bill that has is, that is now emerged. So all of these bills are actually associated, I think, with this new legal structure around preventive detention that that we seem to be having. And this is a kind of a legal shift that has taken place. And this is what the cinemas also seems to be chronicling. So that was my quick summary and provocation. And uh, so now, I don't know, however you want. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, this book uh, has been uh, published by uh, Tulika Books along with uh, my old comrade, colleague, friend, Vivan Sundaram, who uh, started the Shergil Sundaram Arts Foundation. And uh, so the Shergil Sundaram Arts Foundation and Tulika Books has a joint imprint. So SSV Tulika, so this is published by them. And unfortunately, Vivan passed away uh, just about the time that this book came out. So we, in fact, in fact, I think we couldn't, ah, so I'll show you some of these images. Uh, and then we'll be done. So he passed away the very day on which it's supposed to be, but so we couldn't. Um, this book has had a number of uh, launches and events, but the one that I'm particularly proud of was one that happened inside the FTI, organized by the Students Association of the FTI. <coughs> and so these are some of the images that were there. And uh, you may want to know that exactly in this space, this is a wisdom tree, exactly in the space where this wisdom tree was, was the poster Remember Babri. Um, which is what is now got the FTI. So uh, Shayantan, Mankab, uh, and many of the students who were involved in organizing this particular launch, and I have hundreds of WhatsApp images, this thing are currently facing. Um, so this is uh, the launch that happened. So this is Kisle, this is uh, Ajay, sorry, this is um, uh, Amir Gore, this is Nachi, this is Vikas Ars, this is Ajayan. Uh, all the people who led the strike were all present. Uh, at that point of time. So uh, this is Pratik Bats. <laughs> uh, this is KM Kamal. You, you'll, you'll know him. Uh, so the, they were, all these people were there at that time. And uh, at that time, this was September. Uh, at that time, the, this huge enthusiasm when this book came out and all that. You know, everybody thought that this could lead to a whole new interest in FTII and that you know all these filmmakers coming and free conversations between the filmmakers and the students and the students expressing their anxieties and concerns and worries and all that. This was in September. Then in uh, January 20, uh, January 22nd, the Ayodhya thing happened and they put up this Remember Babri. In February, the students were arrested and there are now both Chantan and Mankab have uh, uh, charges against them. Even now, if I'm not mistaken, the bail has not been agreed to. And what I have done is I've donated the full cause of the full uh, proceedings of this book to the students. Um, so for their for their bill, uh, this thing, so all the royalties will go to them. <laughs> no, nothing. It's not. I, mean, I was just mentioning it as an aside. Um, so I mean, I was saying that this. I mean, and the other thing was that very weird was that I mean, these are kids. You know, I mean, your age, uh, half my age, sometimes one third my age. Uh, I've never actually uh, spoke. I, I've never done this before to the extent that I've. I mean, I spoke to many of them. Um, I spoke to them across a generational history, as it were. And obviously, I was concerned about not uh, making sure that I didn't uh, misrepresent them or anything like that. Um, and they were all very frank and honest about talking about what had happened and what they did. And so this has been quite extensively documenting that, that history. But then um, 35 students who were arrested, so in, in, in August 18, 2015, which is when the police entered the campus, they entered 24 hours after the gherao of the director. 
they enter the following night and they enter post midnight. Okay, imagine an academic institution and the police entering in that institution post midnight with a list saying that these are the people whom, whose names we want, you know. And uh, they were able to arrest five of those students that very night, but there are 35 students against whom there are charge sheets and that case is still going on in court. So one problem was that when this book was about to be published, suddenly some of them got cold feet. And they said, Ki, Are, but you know, wait, 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 Abhi, humne to, humne to puri ki puri baat kar liya, aur aapne lik bhi liya. Lekin, are we doing something that is, uh, that is uh, whatever, subjudice? You know, are we doing something that could cause problems? So I then had to, uh, we had to delay the publishing of the book and I had to for the first time, hopefully the last time in my life, I'm sure this is not an unusual thing of filmmakers, uh, I had to get my book legally vetted. You know, I had to actually look at the, get a lawyer to go through the whole book. And there was one entire section which I had to remove, uh, unfortunately. Uh, this was the only time in the book when I have become personal. Actually, this book, it's of course a book that only I could have written to the limited extent that the history of 30, 40 years which I am recording is a history that I personally saw for myself. But I've, I've, I've tried very hard to remove the first person singular. So it's, not, it's like not me writing. But I entered this particular book at a, entered the particular book at a specific moment, which is that uh, um, Shoma Sen, um, was my colleague and classmate in uh, in uh, in Elphinstone College, and she was like back in the late 70s, the person who told me all about where the radical, you know, ideas came from. You know the name of Shoma Sen, right? Um, so I mean, we're hoping that she will now be released because actually now some of these cases are coming up uh, before the Supreme Court. Her bail application may happen, but her daughter Coel was a student in the strike. Coel Sen was a student in the FTI in the strike. So I used Coel Sen's presence to make a sudden detour into a long history involving, you know, how this came to be before Bhima Koregao, uh, so to say. And that whole section, the lawyer said, is Kodado, you know, that this, this you cannot, because you are endangering Shoma Sen's legal yeah. case. You know, you are make, you're saying things that she may deny. She may, you know, he said, for all you know, again, speaking confidentially, she may uh, not want to admit that she wasn't there. You know, you can't say this. You know, there's many things that you can't say. So that one thing I feel very sorry about because my personal, my person was in, in, invested in this. So that had to go for legal reasons. Other than that, the book sort of remained okay. And Touchwood, uh, um, I have not had any trouble. It's been out for about seven, eight months. So all's good. Done. Uh, I mean, happy to you know take comments. Anything, anything that you may want to. Uh, yeah. Um, when the protest is going on, uh, Gajendra Chauhan uh, is against the appointment of Gajendra Chauhan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to what extent was it um, directed because of the question of merit? Uh, versus the entire milieu that BJP had just come into power and this yeah. was uh, this was changing the character of the nation now. Uh, what was the difference you think um, in the two sort of thrusts? No, the, see the Gajendra Chauhan issue was very interesting. You know, the problem was that when they first of all first of all in june 11 2015 when the name was first announced um, no one knew who he was he, who, who is this guy you know gajendra chauhan so they all looked him up and they said acha yudhishthir he played yudhishthir then they said no 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 this guy actually acted in some porn films also you know kuli khidki and things like that then word came out that uh, the INB ministry itself had not been very clear about who this guy was. They knew who the BJP guy, he had lobbied for this position, so they gave it to him. Now when this became a controversy, the news was that INB ministry was starting to get scared and that they were going to backtrack. You know? But within four days of that, the other names of the FTI governing council came out. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, Anaga Ghaisas. Now, Anaga Ghaisas has made films like, uh, I think, uh, what, Katha Modi Ji Ki, or something like that. And she had had a legal control case along against an ex-FTI student called Nandan Kodiyari. 
in which the, I'd have reproduced that in this thing, there's actually a, a, a high court statement saying that this particular filmmaker knows nothing about cinema or something like that. But the other guy, uh, whose name I've forgotten, uh, some Maharashtrian name, actually was leading the ABVP when the attack in 2013 happened. So this name they knew very well. Uh, I, I've forgotten his name. He's, he's a headmaster of this college in Bombay, university, uh, college in Bombay, I think. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I'll, I'll just remember the name in, in, in a minute. That was then something that was not. Uh, see, Gajendra Chaur, what happened was that they said that, Are, but just because he's a B movie star, ka kya farak padda? Nasiruddin Shah has made many bad films. Vinod Khanna, who made awful films, was considered a very good chairman of the governing council when he was there in 2000. Because he did a lot of good things for the students. So, SNE was that just because the fellows made bad films, that he's a bad guy. That is, Vikarana takes that, although they took an elitist position, you know, they said that, you know, Mridal Sen, Girish Karnat, Saeed Mirza, you are Anant Murthy, all these great names, and ye kaun hai, you know. That was an elitist position, you know. Abhi ye kaun hai ka kya matlab? I mean, you know, he, he is, whatever he is, you know, he is, he is a film actor, you know. The problem wasn't that. There were two things. The second issue was that that was an elitist position that Bollywood and the mainstream Hindi commercial cinema came out in support of the students on that. Gajendra Chauhan issue, saying that, yeah, you know, this guy is not qualified, you know. But, the, I mean, it became a much more complicated kind of question. The, see, what, I, what I've described is, as, as, as clean Chauhan, anti, clean anti-Chauhanism. You know, it meant that anti-Chauhanism was something that, we all understood that politics, you know. There was no, no, no problem with that, you know. It was like, ha, 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 you know, this guy is not qualified. It, that particular form of elitist, you know, anti-low uh, class, or anti-pornography kind of, politics was something that I think could, took them a, a fair distance, but it did not accommodate the messiness and complexity of that, of that situation in FDI itself. But I think it's true that as a making it into a nationwide cause, the Chauhan issue was what led to a lot of traction. Uh, so that, that's, certainly, that's certainly the case. Anyone, you might want to. Haru, come on. So, I think when I was very proud of that, I think that the opening of the scene is an international scene. And so, I think that the CBHC will not get a certificate. But no filmmaker will go to jail, what will happen, 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 what will you know, वो आके वो actually you know and 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 वो basically you know ये जो reasonable restrictions है ना that preventive detention sorry नहीं क्या बोलते हैं public law public order security and integrity of India friendly relations with foreign countries and एक दो और चीजें हैं this was what is section 69A of the broad of the IT Act so, today, there are a lot of arrests for online content that is under that, you know, that is under that particular thing. And I think that also defines OTT platforms. So, now, what is that film, that story, that Malayalam, sorry, Tamil actress, right? That cooking, that she has to... Huh? No, no. Sorry? Basically, that the point is that she she is learning how to cook, and वो कुछ एक पुराण 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 पढ़ता है उसको, and that point apparently this was where the problem had arisen. So that arrest happened, that that banning happened. They actually withdrew the the series under this section 69 of the Information Technology Act. So original जो privacy bill थी draft data protection bill that was section 35A, which was about the same thing. Cinematograph amendment bill भी वही है. You know, के actually हुआ ये कि censor board important ये इस इस वजह से रही है कि 
फिल्म इंडस्ट्री वालों ने यह कहा था कि अगर हमें सेंसर सर्टिफिकेट मिल जाए तो उसके बाद कोई और हमें रोक रोक नहीं सकता है यू नो देन वी हैव द राइट टू शो द फिल्म उसके बाद अगर कोई लॉ एंड ऑर्डर प्रॉब्लम हो गया तो वो जिम्मेदारी आपकी है संभालने की यू कैन नॉट प्रिवेंट माई फिल्म फ्रॉम बींग शोन बट द एक्सप्लिसिट इंस्ट्रक्शन इज कि सेंसर सेंसर सर्टिफिकेट मिले ना मिले हम तुम्हारी फिल्म ये कर सकते हैं बंद कर सकते हैं अगर हम चाहें तो अंडर द नेम ऑफ दिस सेक्शन सिक्स नाइन एट एंड हैव फीलिंग दैट दिस इज ऑल्सो ट्रांसलेट इन द ब्रॉडकास्टिंग बिल बट दैट इज टू बी सीन दैट आई हैव नॉट फुल्ली फुल्ली लुकड एट या exist or how much people like people didn't care there has been no nation wide protest when 150 representative of their voices being thrown out or silent and then quickly three four significant bill has been passed yeah. in absence of those yeah. voices and to a large extent i don't see public at large is concerned about that mm. so no i mean politically what can we do with the question i don't i mean i am not that kind of political theorist so i don't know i don't have an answer to that all i'm saying is that i think i'm very interested in the fact that something very significant has changed um that something very significant which has changed i cannot attribute only and solely to the current government i'm not saying that they're not responsible but i don't think that it's limited to that i think it's a larger situation i also think i mean changing the subject a bit i think that it's to do with the arrival of digital technology and digital platforms and i feel also that uh, this is an argument i've elsewhere made that if the military compl- industrial complex had defined the 20th century then is the digital ecosystem that's defining state power in the 21st and state power has become far more powerful across the planet than it has ever been leading to a huge amount of these new right wing regimes that have taken place because the legal apparatus in many of these places has not matched up to the kind of power that's there and if this is going to affect the united states you know which is a far more de- then what what hope for indonesia or uh, or turkey effectively so now in if you theorize it like that if you theorize it in a planetary kind of sense almost which is what i am interested in doing then the question is really what is the frame within which one can analyze this and understand it not in terms of anything specific but rather in terms of something larger yeah. and for me what's very interesting is what does the cinema have to say to this situation and surprisingly cinema has a lot to say to it you know uh, i mean i mean and and this is not necessarily cinema that's asking the big questions but it is a cinema that i think from my particular frame is situated within this picture and i feel that i can understand these films better in the light of such a such a frame you know even though the films themselves might be like shahrukh khan's film for example very very precise very local almost but i think i can locate them within such a such a conception because i think there's an aesthetic practice that is responding to this new situation which i which i'm interested in I'm particularly interested in this uh, idea of like the invisible filmmaker basically yeah. vanishing uh, in between like the interface of uh, I don't know the governing bodies and the public at large. Um, I remember Sanjay Kaur sort of talking about you know the new kind of so-called documentary that's entering where you have WhatsApp forwards of you know long takes of things. For example, the most famous one being like the pull the CCTV footage of the. uh police entering in jamia and like slowly and gradually kind of like so that by itself becomes a documentary although his argument was that jab tak filmmaker jab wo exist karke usko interpret nahi kar raha hai to wo documentary nahi hai that that uh, that does that kind of media that exists in abundance in our lives right now we are constantly sort of like uh, footage from palestine for example or in india or whatever like we keep looking at these long long films so to speak So uh, I wanted to know your opinions about you know um, does uh, what is the filmmaker's role here? Uh, what does he become? <coughs> what does he usually become in 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 terms of like are they, are they only present for contextualizing now in that sense uh, or are they even important if they're slowly becoming invisible? I mean for me, what's very interesting is the navigation. You know, 
it is the process of navigation and the process of circulation as it were you know the the, the uh, so you know hitostayal you know that uh, whole thing about the poor image uh, as she calls it she calls it what does she call it the the wretched the wretched of the screen uh, you know that that these these low res jpegs which are lying or low res you know mp4s whatever that are that are in the, they are the kind of they they like the supplicants uh, you know of this of this but what happens is that the 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 low res nature of it is actually and this is something that we've been talking about in the class something that can actually be reinvigorated with new meaning based on you know how you what meaning you read into it and how you how you signify it as it were and i think filmmakers do play that role i mean your film for example i mean to take just an instance and i think there are many other examples you know actually the process of 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 wending your way through this this excess of information that we are in is where the is 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 where the where the what is what what defines this you know so in that sense the filmmaker has a role of some form of in this particular structure form of real time receiving processing and reinterpreting and narrativizing if necessary you know this mass of images through which that film wends its way uh, something like that you know the, the whole series of films that seem to be doing exactly that um in that particular instance i mean if sanjay kak's uh, thing is 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 what what i'm what i'm thinking of i mean i'm not terribly sure that the filmmaker's interpretative role is that that significant you know i mean i, I think that you know this new netflix kind of documentary you know the the does do that you know it actually it actually takes reality and then makes almost like a science fiction version of that reality and gives you a full on interpretation you know and and they will even find people to to do that you know and and i think that i mean some filmmakers do do it i mean i'm not i'm not against it but i do have a little i mean to take just one example in anand patwardhan's reason i've been fairly critical of that film you know uh, i mean i'm i'm not very very sure because he has a full on story you know and he has a complete explanation of what happened and he makes it almost like a kind of a conspiracy theory you know that you know this happened that happened some other some mastermind who's actually working it all out you know and he will i mean he's the filmmaker who he is so he's able to find the evidence for it also you know but but that's the kind of thing i'm 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 a little nervous about that you know and i i think that filmmakers who reveal how they are navigating this are actually for me very important you know that's an important practice i i feel and and you, you yeah so Yeah. Um, I like talking discussion with Mr. Ravi. Uh you seem to be more vocal about the change. Mm. Um no, I think I'm, I think change change is history. I don't think anyone is trying to change anybody. Anyway. I mean I, I think when you talk about the change it's not attempting change at all. I mean I have a very strong feeling that we are literally post change. in the sense that i am not trying to change anybody uh, change you you are not trying to change me and and you know i mean the the language of change is something that i think is absolutely obsolete um i mean we are who we are positions have become absolutely entrenched as it were and the only only thing that's happening is negotiation you know how you negotiate from whatever power or lack of power that you have is 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 the only thing they're trying to deal with i do i don't know that you know i mean i have in a rather different context uh wanted to argue for what i almost called a post passive revolution sort of imagination i mean the the quick history being that at one time many many years or centuries or decades ago we used to talk about revolution in an active sense it meant like with the american revolution or the soviet revolution or the chinese revolution that the new will come and erase the old that the new will create its own structures its new constitution its own sort of structures yeah the second thing that happened after that was the idea of the new sitting on top of the old so the new would come the old wouldn't go away and the new would gradually change the old over time you know so uh, the argument is made about india that india india saw a passive revolution which means that in 1947 india got independence not the people of india you know the symbolic entity india got independence and it then over time has selectively dispersed independence 
two different people at different locations and some parts of India have still not been independent, you know, some parts have. But I feel that we even move beyond that. I think that this particular assumption of modernity to cause change is literally finished now. So we are, we are, we are in the digital era, no one is trying to change. In, if they are, then I don't think, it, it's just entirely a negotiated sort of structure, but that's an extreme position. So I'm actually, I'm actually not a change person. Uh, and I think that's also, I mean, that's also important because I think that that is also, see, this is also allows me to reflect on some of these, these films, you know, I mean, you know, why, you know, what, you know, the, the basic, the basic narrative of all cinema or all narratives is what, you know, it starts with a kind of a complicated political reality and ends with a happily ever after, you know, when good triumphs over evil. But I think that the narrative itself is now gone. And I don't think, I mean, you look around you and look, see even the kind of most simplest Netflix films, and you'll not see good triumphing over evil. You know, it's not, I mean, that narrative itself is gone. Uh, I mean, narrative, it, it now cha ends with some, uh, I don't know, either some utopian situation or it, it, it literally has the filmmaker throwing up its but that is what life is. Kya kiya jai, kind of thing, you know. I don't know, I mean, uh, I mean, all I'm saying is, I mean, this is all contentious. All I'm saying is that this kind of situation wherein has aesthetic consequences. And I think that films allow you to throw light on, on, on these uh, situations. So, yeah. Well, on Amazon, I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, otherwise, if you want to be politically responsible, then you should buy it either from Tulika or Leftward books. Directly. Huh? Directly on the Leftward. Yeah, yeah, you can buy it on the Leftward uh, on the Tulika website. Yeah. That's the easiest. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh,